This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Welcome to the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre. These seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. They are located at Times Square in the heart of the theatre. It's the heart of the theater for New York. It's where everything that happens in the theater happens here and goes across the country. And everything that is exciting, and there's a lots and lots of things that are exciting in resident companies across the country and in university companies that are coming into New York. So this is the hub. This is the heartbeat of theater. These seminars are but one of the American Theatre Wing's all year round programs. We have a hospital show program. We go to hospitals and nursing homes and aid centers and we bring theatre to those that can't come to it. Our Saturday Theatre for Children program is indeed a wonderful program. It is just that. On Saturday mornings, theatre brought to the schools for the children to see live theatre. They line up. They buy a ticket, they make a commitment to go to the theater. And that is what we hope, and we have already seen that much of that is taking place. They will be the audience of the future. They're the audience that we need that go to the theater because it's exciting, it's alive, it's magical, it, it broadens our horizons, it does everything that theater can do. It's magical. And they do it not because it is a birthday or an anniversary or a rave review. They do it because they've grown up needing and loving the theater. And that's what we like to instill in the children. We also have another program, these seminars. I think they're one of the most important programs and they certainly are very unique. The, we're known for our Tony Awards in most places and uh, it's a very important award. but. It is not necessarily the only reason for people being here on this panel. The people here have won and will win and will go on to win many Tonys. They are here now because they are knowledgeable and they've come to share their knowledge. They are wise. They know the theater. They are the production team. They are the producers here the producers of Orpheus Descending. And while they are here, they will tend to tell you what it is that goes into working in the theater. They, we've had, well, we've had a, a seminar on the performance, we've had a seminar on the play script and the director, and now to bring it all together, the producers, the production team of Orpheus Descending. I'm going to ask Jean Dalrymple, who is our wonderful board member. Jean has produced, she's written, she's directed. Ed Wilson, who is critic and is not here as a critic today, but he is here just because he loves the theater and as director for the Center of Theater Arts at CUNY. I'm going to turn this over to them both and they will in turn introduce our panelists. Thank you very much for coming. Ed? Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, I'll introduce the members of the panel to my right, to my far right, one of the premier theatrical lawyers in New York City who's worked on innumerable productions with which you're familiar with, the law firm of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison, Mr. John Braglio. And to my immediate right, uh, the producer of Orpheus Descending, Elizabeth McCann, who uh, has, in, among her productions, garnered 63 Tony nominations and 20 Tony Awards. She's brought over many of the productions of the Royal Shakespeare Company, and now she's brought us Orpheus Descending. Elizabeth McCann. Jean? Yes. To my far left, it's a very dear friend and a colleague, one of the greatest press agents in New York. And uh, we can't do, can't do a show without him publicizing it. And right now, of course, he's publicizing Office Descending, and his name is Josh Ellis. <laughs> and, and right next to him is one of the women who has become uh, important 
in, in my day, you know, women were secretaries. That's about all they ever were in the theater. And some of them were very good. But nowadays, they are, well, they're head of advertising, and she is, and her name is Nancy Coyne. And then we have someone who is very, very important to the production, another woman I'm happy to see. And her name is Barbara D Darwell, and she's the general manager. And the general manager does all the work. <laughs> <laughs> as Jean, as, as uh, Jean and Isabel have said, today we're talking about how a production is put together and how it's brought to Broadway. And in this case, Orpheus Descending. The play started a little differently from some that we see in that it was first produced in London. And I think we should really start the saga with that production because I assume, Liz, that's where it all started. And how did it, what were, went into the decision of whether to bring it to New York or not, and who would bring it to New York? Well, uh, first of all, I'm not going to answer the question. Um, <laughs> because it, the first thing that struck me sitting here, which I must say, is that everybody sitting here has worked together on every production I've ever done. And I suddenly looked around and realized how very fortunate I am. John has always been my lawyer, and Josh has always been my press agent, and Nancy's always been my advertising agency. And Barbara is herself a producer and um, worked for me years ago as a manager, came back to general manage this show, although she's a producer because I needed rather extraordinary help. So it, I just kind of, I have to say that because, I mean, this is it, and I don't want to produce plays with anybody else. That's it. I mean, Barbara Streisand comes back to Broadway tomorrow, and she says, you can't have that press agent, you can't have that lawyer. I'm going to say, Ms. Streisand, go someplace else. That's how strongly I feel about these people when it's time I said it. How do, well, Orpheus started here. I mean, I was going through one of my periodical, I don't want to be in the theater anymore moods. And uh, John called up and suggested I go to London to look at Orpheus Descending. And I said, oh, no, John. I mean, it's big, and it's Vanessa Redgrave. Oh, my God, no. And John kept jabbing at me. And he jabbed at me, and finally he called up, and he said, this is the last week that play is closing in London next week, and I've called Jimmy Needlander, and I think he's interested, and I think the two of you could get together, so go to London. So really, at his insistence and his prodding, which has to be very clearly stated, there, John is truly the godfather in the best sense of that term. Uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to use that word because John is Italian. And I hesitate to use that phrase. But, but in the best sense of godfather, John is the godfather of Orpheus. And so off I went to London and I, I met Vanessa in a somewhat jet-lagged stupor. And I mean that because when I get intimidated by stars, I mean, first of all, I don't drink. And when I get intimidated, I do drink. And <laughs> Vanessa and I went out to dinner, and she did her basic maid servant act, which she kept leaping up and filling my wine glass. <laughs> so that by the end of the evening, uh, I mean, there's something Miss Redgrave is rather tall, and she's hardly pixie-like, leaping up to fill my wine glass. I'm not sure whether I agreed to do the play out of conviction or out of stupor. But in any event, I did agree to do it, and I came back to New York. Jimmy Needlander, who was my partner, did not get over to see the play. And I said, yeah, I think, well, let's do it. I mean, that was kind of the phrase. Um, and it, it was a roller coaster and wonderful adventure. It was the when most. Say, when you say roller coaster, they, it must mean ups and downs. Was it on and off and on and off? Or? Oh, I wouldn't say that. I mean, <laughs> between Miss Redgrave and Sir Peter Hall and everybody else, I felt like, you know, that scene before the Kentucky Derby where they're trying to get thoroughbred racehorses to get to the gate so you can start the race? I felt for about four months I was pulling these people towards the starting gate and they're constantly rearing up and skidding away and, and shifting away. And so. It was, it was a complicated series of negotiations because I think there was, uh, well, there were f everybody had four agents for one thing. That always, so if one agent said yes, the other agent said no. You remember that <laughs> scene, John? I'd say I'd, I have a deal confirmed in writing that didn't mean anything. I mean, it, people were constantly shifting their, so it did take a while to put, put it together because of the complexity of the personalities involved. But we did finally, John and I finally managed somehow to prevail over ICM and Sam Cohen and several other happy people. I, I might say, <clears throat> Liz is very generous to say that I was the godfather, but really the, the, these shows don't take birth until you get someone like Liz involved. And it's, it's easy for me to make phone calls, which is what you know, lawyers get paid to talk and to 
put out very well. pieces of paper. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it always gets in every program somehow. <laughs> but uh, Liz, did you have any trepidation about its past, about all the difficulty with the past productions? Well, yes and no, because actually, somehow we had, I mean, um, I've had a sort of history, and particularly back with Nell Nugent, of doing plays that nobody wanted to do, the most obvious one being Mornings at Seven. And um, the fact that a play has not been well received at one time does not necessarily ever frighten me. I think that a play is just lines on a piece of paper and a particular artist interprets an author's work and at a particular moment the right artist comes along and I think there have been plays that have failed because it was the wrong director, not necessarily an untalented director, an untalented cast, but maybe just the wrong mix of people right. at the wrong time and I think that... It's like the wrong conductor for a piece of music. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. before we leave this question, Jean, just ask, when you saw the production in London, uh, jet lag notwithstanding and uh, Ms. Redgrave's filling your wine glass. You must have been struck by the production, or I mean, you must have had must have had some effect on you, obviously. It, I think, yes, it had a very. Um, it it obviously hit me on a number of levels. I think the play text hit, hit me on levels that I was on a kind of subconscious psychological level, and I think Miss Redgrave hit me. I've always been a kind of romanticist about the theater, and one of my great. Um, Disappointments is that I never saw Lorette Taylor play The Glass Menagerie. I mean, I don't ask me why, I wish I'd done it. And I believe that great performances sometimes define plays. And I got to this point where I felt this was a great actress. And that if she would come to New York, it, it would enliven our own theatrical tradition in this city. I felt, I, I got very kind of hooked on that notion of remembering Lorette Taylor and never having seen Lorette Taylor. And I, where would Tennessee have been without Lorette Taylor? Um, on the subject of Miss Redgrave, yes, she is a risk, or was a risk, or perceived as a risk at one time. And a risk in what sense? Well, Miss Redgrave has from time to time been somewhat controversial, and yes. there were people who said that she might be controversial again, and, and that was a worry. I mean, would people not want to see her? Um, would there be people who would avoid the box of us, huh? Would pick at her. Would pick it, absolutely yeah. right. I mean, there was that concern. I mean, but <coughs> theater is about risk. Um, mm -hmm. So, she was a great artist. That's what I focused on, and I felt that, that this was a great interpretation of Tennessee Williams, and I felt it. I wanted to see if I could make it come to New York. Were there, right. were hmm? there places, John, where you felt it might just break down altogether in terms of negotiations? <coughs> well, that. You never know what what uh, what battles you're you're going to be fighting and what uh, you know what what the war is until you get into it. And um, uh, as I s uh, said briefly before, it was one thing to uh, entice Liz to see if she would do it. And uh, Jimmy Niederlander had said he was committed to doing it. But uh, you really need the force of a, a producer like Liz to put together the kind of uh, jigsaw puzzle that you have with. Uh, personalities like <coughs> uh, Ms. Redgrave and, and Sir Peter Hall, and then you have institutional problems too. You have, the, you have the British producer having to kind of fit together with the American producer. The rights uh, over there didn't quite fit with the rights we needed here if we were going to raise money. Uh, and uh, then there were very serious problems of rehearsal and scheduling. All those I kind of vaguely knew were sitting there in the background. And I wasn't about to give Liz even an inkling of half of them, because all I wanted to do was to get her excited about the property itself. And once she, once she had that in her, and she's expressed it so what eloquently. What made you so excited better. about the property? Well, it's a good question, because as Liz was mentioning it and saying to me, uh, reminding me about our conversations, I was thinking back of how it started. And I guess it was a series of things. I knew the play uh, uh, somewhat, but I had never seen it um, uh, performed anywhere. And it seemed to me that we needed a very important event to open up the season this, this year. And we didn't have it. There really weren't any big shows planned when we spoke. I can't remember when we spoke about it, but we pretty much know what's coming in by June or July of the, the previous year. And there was no big event. 
And Broadway is, is driven by events. Big musicals are the most important ones. But if you can't get a big musical, you get a big star. And there are maybe, you know, 15 stars in the world, maybe fewer than that, who can really drive ticket sales in, 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 on Broadway. Vanessa Redgrave, in my view, was one of them. So I, I knew about the play over there, and obviously, Sir Peter Hall is, you know, an extraordinary director. And then there, there were a series of reviews that came out, and one of the most significant ones was, was Frank Rich's. And there's no doubt that that's a reality in the theater. If the New York Times says that there's an important production in London, you have to take notice of it. Whether you like or dislike Frank Rich's reviews, that's a business reality. And I read that. I then got in touch with uh, one of the uh, executive producers over there, <coughs> a woman by the name of Thelma Holt, spoke to her, and she described to me the difficulty that they were having in getting the show over here. And the, the, the very, very tr tragic part of these conversations was that she was telling me that no one seemed to want to take the risk. And usually the risk is financial only, just because they think, well, we won't sell enough tickets. This time, the risk was added to by Vanessa Redgrave's <laughs> controversy. And everyone said this is a superb production, but do we really want Vanessa Redgrave on Broadway? And can we take that risk? And I, there are very few people in this business who go on the basis of their instincts artistically. And I knew Liz was one of those people who, if she loved the piece, would do it and say, look, that has to be seen. That's a piece that must be done. And that's what Jimmy had said to me. Jimmy Niederlander said, if we can do this, I don't believe political concerns aside, this woman should be stopped from doing this production in this country. We must see her. Okay. And if you remember, the Rushdie thing was, uh, was going around that, at that time, that controversy, which suggested to me that there was enormous support for ex artistic expression as opposed to, you know, the political issues involved. So, uh, a combination of my interest in the piece, a combination of wanting to get my clients doing something important, I had a self-interest in getting Liz to produce it, obviously. Uh, to the theater. So I sent her over there, yes, and came back. She loved it. And then, you know, easy, as I said, easy for me to say, we then faced, uh, you know, what, five months of... Well, yeah, there's, there's one story John is omitting. Money, Liz. Uh, well, there's one story I'm going to, again, I'm not going to answer the question, but um, <laughs> there is one classic moment in the theater, and that is James Needlander is a, and I were sitting around, and things were all falling apart, and this wasn't going to happen, and Jimmy was saying, James, Liz, this is so impossible. Why are we wasting our time? And John suddenly rose up like a young Clarence Darrow and said, Jimmy, it will be such a tragedy. And Jimmy, who had not seen the production twirled, I mean, said, you didn't say it was a tragedy. <laughs> uh, I said, um, well, I didn't say it was a comedy. And Jimmy, who knows me well, and we've been associated a lot, and who realized the kind of play there, and he said, in other words, it's not a comedy. I said, that's not a comedy. But it's not a tragedy, Jimmy said. I said, that's right, I said it wasn't a comedy. And then John was sort of going back and forth. And, 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 and Jimmy um, then did something very strange, because he, he, he knows that there's a tendency on my part to sort of put him down. As you're a theater owner, you don't know, you're not intellectual, you're not sensitive, go away. And, um, and so he looked at me, and he said, um, you know, I saw a Tennessee Williams play once. And I said, no. <laughs> I said, no kidding, did you? He said, yeah, I was in Chicago. I was the box office treasurer on uh, uh, This is the Army. And he said, after I got finished counting up my ticket stubs at the night on This is the Army, he said, I used to walk down to the Civic Theater. Lorette Taylor was down there. She was doing Glass Menagerie. And I said, no kidding, did you ever watch the whole show? He said, nah, I'd walk in, watch a little bit, work out. He said, by the time I got finished counting tickets, I could never get there for the curtain. And then by the time I got there, I had to meet the guys after the show. I said, I watch a little bit every night. I never saw the whole thing. He said, how'd you know what the play was about? And he said, what do you mean, how'd I know what the play was about? I told you, I watched her. And he said, yes, yeah, I to watch her. You knew what the whole thing was about, just watching her. And he said, um, well, Lorette Taylor, she was a hell of a performer. I said, yes. He said, Redgrave's a hell of a performer. And I love that phrase. It isn't she's an artist. It isn't she's an actress. She's a hell of a performer. And so John looked at me, and I looked at him, and we had plunged it. on. <laughs> we just kept going. What was, the, what was the next step in terms since it involved, that I'm sure it begins to involve the people on our other side over here? Well, the next part of the puzzle, of course, was figuring out how to, how to sell this production or how to present it. Let's, let's, let's not use the phrase sell, because I think that understates what Nancy and Josh do. 
um, I think a lot of producers make the mistake that they're selling initially. I think initially you're, you're positioning or, or presenting um, for what's going to come <coughs> after what. Now, uh, this is one of those sessions, why not let it all hang out? J Jimmy had one condition of doing this show, and that was that Nancy would not be the ad agency. And I don't care who you use, but I don't want that Serena outfit in here. <laughs> and I said, all right, Jimmy, that's a, that's a fair condition, right? And uh, he said, I know they're the best. There's no, you're absolutely right, they're the best, but they, they're too chummy with the Schuberts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I kind of said, oh, you know, I mean, jo I mean, Jimmy thinks that Nancy spends her entire, Nancy's partner spends her entire morning talking to the Schubert. So anyway, I said, okay, Jimmy, well, if that's the way it's going to be, that's the way it's going to be. And I did, you know, go and talk to two or three other ad agencies in New York um, and kind of kept dragging, not, I mean, it really, I knew there was only one person who could do the show. I knew it was Nancy. And I knew, um, uh, and so... Nancy and I kept chatting while I kept looking at posters from other ad agencies of broken bird wings. And um, <laughs> for those of you who've seen the play, I mean, a lot of broken bird wings, a lot of, a lot of birds without feet, a lot of uh, eyes, I mean, a lot of symbolism and dreadful posters. And, and I do think Sereno is the best because I think that Nancy, uh, Nancy doesn't submit artwork. We sit around and we talk about what's the problem and what's the concept. We did that in phone conversations with the ad agency that wasn't going to do the show. And then Nancy said, come over here, there's something I want to show you. And the rest of the story belongs to you two. <laughs> right? OK. Well, I'll pick it up. Yeah. Um, I felt very much the way I think John has described it. It was going to be an event. And it was an event that had Vanessa Redgrave in the forefront of it. And there seemed to be no point in selling a bird's wing if we had Vanessa Redgrave. And there was a picture that Liz had shown me that I think is over there on the wall that captured the spirit of the play and certainly the, the magnitude of the actress. And so it was just a question, really, of handling Vanessa Redgrave in such a way that we walked right past any possible controversy that was going to come up about her politics. And um, well, how we decided to position it together was to make a very simple statement. You can't argue with greatness. That was the line. And you can't, not on, not on a stage. You can argue with people's politics privately at a dinner party afterwards, but that's pretty irrelevant to what was going on on the stage or what was to go on on the stage. And so that was, that was basically the campaign. You can't argue with greatness with a picture of Vanessa Redgrave, a couple of fabulous quotes to support it, Frank Rich, um, Time Magazine, Newsweek. They'd all said that she was the greatest actress in the English-speaking theater. And it seemed, from my research, asking people what they want to see on the stage, um, the first thing they say is a star. And the second th thing they say is a star in a great play. So that's what we had. It seemed like it was going to be a joy to work on, and it has been. Is, is, do you see your, one of your main responsibility, or one of your primary responsibilities, to develop the visual images on posters and newspaper ads and the words that will go with that? Is that really the sort of starting point for all of your work? Absolutely. The posters have become um, a, a problem of sorts in that it, it draws a lot of focus to itself. Everyone now wants to design a poster. They collect posters. We have theater posters as art, as an art form. And sometimes we lose sight of the fact that they're supposed to do a job. They're not just supposed to be beautiful unto themselves and collector's item. They're supposed to put forth an image of a production so that the public will start to get a feeling. They don't have to tell the whole story. Um, maybe they can just arrest the eye. But they have to be compatible with what's on stage to some degree. And they have to give, they're, they're a free sample, if you will. When you are selling detergent, let's say. You can come home and there's a little packet of detergent hanging on your apartment door. Um, this is a, an, a way of giving a, a taste to the public of what a show will be like visually. And um, I think that the picture is glorious. Why did you not do three sheets? Why did you just do posters? Well, when we decide how to advertise mm -hmm. a show, part of it is not just what the look will be and what the words will be, but where we'll put the image. And we thought that the story could best be told in print, not, not on subway posters, but in print, and also in radio. And we did um, extensive radio work not on this. television? Well, television's become a very expensive medium for the theater. You have a fixed number of seats that you can sell. You have only 
a thousand seats in a house, only eight performances. You can't spend an unlimited amount of money in advertising and television. Makes is very that decision, expensive. You and the producer, the producer, the general manager. Right. Do you, that, then you, you come in. You came in on that decision and where the money is to be spent on on, on the advertising. The, uh, it, is there ever a difference between the poster ad? and the ad that goes in the newspaper? Or do you try to make them the same, or do you have to make a real adjustment there? Sometimes there's a difference. We try to make them compatible. Sometimes there will be a logo, for instance. And when you get down to a very small ad, you'll just see the logo. Because frankly, when a show like Orpheus Descending has been running for a while, people who are turning to the newspaper to find out about a show are just looking for the information. They're not looking for a sell here. It's established now that Orpheus Descending is a big hit. We don't need to sell in every little ad. Sometimes just the information is enough. Um, the poster can usually, because of the size, contain more information. So they're, they're usually related, but sometimes a little different. The end. Where is Barbara in this now? I'm the last one in. <laughs> You're the last one in. Yeah, <laughs> Josh comes into the picture All here right. right alongside uh, okay. Nancy. Think, we should talk about early on, this was a very, very lonely path. <laughs> and I want to talk about the fact that early on was very lonely. Um, Orpheus is Ending is a huge hit on Broadway now, but I remember in the early days of talking about this show, there were people who would say to me, I simply will not see that show. Uh, there were people who would say, I heard it's wonderful in London, and I will see it because I, she's a great artist. But there was also going to be people who said, I don't care how good you tell me she is, I do not want to see Vanessa Redgrave in a play. And it was lonely at the beginning of this road because it was not something that immediately you would say, Vanessa Redgrave in Tennessee Williams, Orpheus Ascending, directed by Sir Peter Hall, and have it instantly be the thing that everyone leaps over to you and says, yes, I really want to do it. I think it's, it's going to be a huge hit and presume that it's going to be a big hit. That wasn't the way it was early on at all. People knew that it was a success there. They knew that Frank Rich was extremely, extremely positive about the play and the production and her performance. But it wasn't one of those kind of things where you could absolutely sit back and relax and have it all happen. It was a very active way of getting people to have a certain attitude about what, w what was happening on that stage and how to make those people who said, I simply will not see her, <laughs> turn around and say, yes, I do want to go to see her. The measure of the success of that is really due to everybody on this panel. I mean, in point of fact, those same people are now calling me up and saying, please, can't we get tickets for next Thursday? No, you'll have to wait for two or three months to get those <laughs> tickets. So clearly it's, it's worked, but it is, I guess work is the active word here. It, it didn't happen automatically by any stretch of the imagination, and it's not one of those shows where you go, well, it was a success in London. It will automatically be a success here. Josh, speaking about the show, the production in London, as a press agent, you must have had to decide what to build on from the London reviews and the London success and what to sort of eliminate in terms of starting your campaign here? Did, what, how did you decide what to use and what not to use from London? I, I would say the operative word here is going to be we, because I think it's we decided as a, as a group, most particularly Liz. Um, normally when you have a show that comes from one place to another, you do not emphasize the reviews in the early publicity because you want to come down with a kind of modest expectation so that the critics in New York don't go, well, yes, yeah, well and good that we knew that the London critics liked it or some American critics have liked it. Uh, our decision was very much so to make the London reviews and the American reviews from the London production a very much a part of our orig original campaign and publicity release. I mean, we talked about the fact that Frank Rich had seen it and loved it, and so had Time Magazine, and so had Newsweek. And people, I think this had a lot to do with building people under understanding of two things. One, that it was a success in London. And number two, that there was an artistic validity for its success, not just the fact that they had a big star in it that would sell tickets. That it was very much expressing how Vanessa Redgrave and Sir Peter Hall had come together to create something, and that thing was a landmark production. So that are there times when, you know, would, could you, uh, would there be a case, for example, with a British production where you would not emphasize the reviews at all? There would be other shows 
I presume from what you said that you just wouldn't want to mention the reviews, but emphasize. I would say that sometimes when you don't think that, that emphasizing those reviews is important or it could be in fact counterproductive. Um, but in this case, you obviously thought they were. I thought it was. Uh, we thought it was urgent that it be that because. I mean, we had, we had talked, other seminars talk about straight plays. I mean, you know, we're talking about a straight play on Broadway. And even though Vanessa Redgrave is a big star, it's still a straight play. There's not a musical. We don't have, it's not a play with music or something like that. I mean, there are musical bits, but it's not. Um, and I've learned from bad experience that you, you can't be passive about publicizing dramas on Broadway. It has to be a very, very active process of making people think that they're coming to an event. It's not enough that they're going to see a good play or a great play. They have to know that they're coming to a great event, which John had mentioned earlier. So that the publicity had to do two things. It had to make people realize that it was a great play and simultaneously a great event. Liz, did Barbara you... Barbara has to get oh. into this now <laughs> to complete this picture. Yes, mm -hmm. well, the, the people that are here um, made the play hit, all, all of the people here. Um, do, you, do you spend the money or do you say... I, the put the pl I put the play on stage, mm -hmm. basically. Not in an artistic sense, but I sort of roll up my I sleeves and, and, you know, put, um, put the set on stage and, and make sure what that, that the schedule say, is... What do you is, mean when you say put the set on stage? Well, in this instance, the set came from London. Mm -hmm. And um, with, with many people helping as you know this is a collaborative art you know that is really inspired by the person at the center which is who is the producer this is a for me it has been a, a great joy to work on this production because the theater has changed as as we were speaking of before and and your one experience is um, a real producer a, a, a creative producer the force that drives the, a production forward in the real sense of, of, of inspiration, very rarely. In this case, Liz is, is really one of those producers. And, and so we all, when we speak, speak of we because it, in every sense we came together and collaborated on this production. And we all took the place that it's easiest to, to take. When it happens with ease is, is, is when the, the fewest problems happen and and you all, you know, you're all working toward the same end. Um, in this particular instance, I came on rather late in the production. All of these people were in place. And it, it was time to begin to negotiate the actors' contracts. You know, the rights were in place at that point. And the designers, we had people coming over from London. And, and we put American and London design teams together to bring the show Did that here. that involve equity in the unions and the guilds? All the unions were, all the, the unions, there? yes, all the unions were involved. Liz had arranged for the, for the, um, the equity, uh, exchange. Yes, and all the requirements to be fulfilled in mm -hmm. advance of the negotiations. We also rehearsed in London, which was a very interesting experience. One of the questions I wanted to ask both you and Liz has to do with actors and the number of actors, because there are a lot of actors in this play. And from a financial standpoint, was this, uh, this must have been a real consideration in terms of trying to cost out what you had to gross. And, and how, many, how many actors are on the payroll? 27? No, that's with the stage managers. There's 27 equity members, of which three are stage managers. There's 25. Am I right? Right. And that's about four times at least as many as are in the normal straight play on Broadway these days. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's expensive, but I think that, um, well, I'm tired of seeing two character plays. I mean, you know, one character plays and two character plays and one set plays, and I don't think that's what people want in the theater. I have a very strong feeling about what I think you want. Now, I could be crazy. I remember the night I went to see the front page and that very good revival that Vivian Beaumont did, and there was a young, it was a very young sort of, late high school crowd there and they were sitting sort of mesmerized by all these people coming in and out of doors well they don't see people coming in and out of doors on television they don't I mean that I, I think we've we've got to get away from this you know this desperate thing that's imposed by money I mean I once asked Lynn Meadow at the Manhattan Theatre Club I asked her dramaturge just to check with me the number of characters in the play submitted and most playwrights were writing two character plays 
because they thought they would get on. Now that's a kind of restriction on a playwright. And, and I really believe there's a, there's a sweep to theater. I love epic theater. I love the Nicholas Nicklebys, and I love the, the, the Amadeuses, and I love the, the Orpheuses. I believe they're about big emotions. I mean, every time a critic says something is cinematic, I cringe. I don't want to be cinematic. I want to be theatrical. I mean, I want to tear the scenery apart. I mean, so that, I mean, you know. Yes, I, so I... <laughs> yes, there are a lot of people. <laughs> there are a lot of people. I mean, sometimes okay. I wander around Let's, say, let's so go to the first that. art, Jean. I, I would like to say that I bet there aren't six producers like you left in New York. Oh, I'm sure there are. Six? I think there are yeah. four. Yeah. <laughs> Liz, uh, you've got this continuity of, of crew, in a sense, and yet you periodically leave the theater. <laughs> That's what she said. I, I know. said that this morning. I said that this morning. I know. I'm not I said, this is the you. end. So now we're getting a sort of, is, we, this, we is said, this a look, testimonial or something? Said, I last, know. last night, Liz and I were right. at, a, at, a, at a show, right? And she came up to me and said to me the same thing about uh, a, a new show she's looking at. I won't mention it. And she said, oh, forget it. I'm not going to go see it. It's got 25 people. I don't care. And I said, yes, you will. And I know she will. She'll eventually do it. <laughs> Since this is on the production, let's, let's get into, you know, you've, you've got your crew. You know who is going to do what. And then the money's allocated. And where does the money come from? Where does Duncan Weldon and, and um, Minskoff come in? What is Sir Peter oh, Hall's role? Where does all that come in into this production? How much Let's trouble start. do I get into? <laughs> well, I'm giving all it to you all way. at once so that you can all sift it around. I will get into trouble this morning. No. Since I'm a legend, I can afford to. <laughs> no. When this production was done, like most situations in the theater, there is a billing credit afforded to the London producers. Only the London producers weren't very sure they wanted a billing credit on the American production because they thought Miss Redgrave was controversial. They were perfectly willing to, to make money with her in London, but less willing to make money with her in the United States. So rather than spend all my life worrying about their billing credit, I said, all right, fellas, look, I tell you what, if you ever change your mind, let me know. If you ever want your name in the production, let me know. Yes, they decided they wanted her na their name on the production the day after the box office opened with a line to 8th Avenue. Yeah. Um, which makes me say, in my most cynical fashion, that you're a terrorist if you don't sell tickets, you're Mother Teresa if you do. And I mean, that's, that was in a funny way the bottom line. There was a certain, the, Josh is right, there was, you know, I didn't really go into this with my eyes blind. I went up to the library, I read Miss Redgrave's files, I thought about Miss Redgrave's files. I, I probably know more about Miss Redgrave than Miss Redgrave remembers, as I read every press clipping on her back to the early 60s. And um, my perception of it was very different than the perception of people in the entertainment industry. If I talked to Jewish colleagues in the entertainment industry, they were very frightened. If I talked to Jewish friends outside the entertainment industry, their attitude was, she's an artist, will respect her as an artist. And I found this a very strange dichotomy that people in the theater who, in my view, should respect the artist, were less willing to respect the artist than people outside the theater. And I found that a rather strange <laughs> um, and somewhat saddening um, uh, education on my part. I did not find the prejudice among if you want to say prejudice, I did not find the hesitation about Miss Redgrave outside the theatrical community. Even among people who were, who, were, who were very committed to Israel, very committed to Zionism, outside the theatrical community, they said, she's an artist. If the play's good, maybe we'll go. Well, happily for but, all of us, you, you, know, you went ahead on well, your instincts. Barbara, but, I'd like to ask you about the, because <laughs> you mentioned rehearsing in London, I'd mm -hmm. like to ask you about the whole process now that the, everything's, the pieces have been put together. Right. And it is a little unusual to rehearse in London. And I, the, that whole process and the integration of the American and British parts of the cast and then the traffic problems you might have in terms of uh, actually the running of the show. There was a lot of traffic, on, yeah. a lot of air traffic yeah. on this show. Well, how did, how, how, for how long did it rehearse in London? How many? Uh, it rehearsed three and a half weeks in London and two weeks here. <clears throat> Uh, we staggered 
uh, th there, there were three, uh, Vanessa Redgrave and two other English members of the company were, were, remained from the, from the original cast. And we brought over um, the, the people over the title, and to me, uh, Kevin Anderson and Miss Plummer. And uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Tammy Grimes, <laughs> Mrs. Plummer, um, Mrs. Plummer, to um, to rehearse in in London, and then we added additional principal members of the company, so that we we wound up um, with almost the entire company in London by the time we then returned so to the United other States. Other people, like for instance Sloane Shelton, who plays one of the gossips in this, uh, the, when would she have come over? Then? She came. She came over for the second week of rehearsal <coughs> in London and stayed for two weeks. How costly was it to your budget doing it? It, 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 was, it was certainly, we, we, we didn't really know until quite late on that we were going to rehearse in London. That was a decision that was, that was left until the last moment and it was predicated on Miss Redgrave's commitment to a production that she was in in the West End at that time. And um, Liz decided about three or four weeks before rehearsals were to begin that we were really going to London and then the wheels started did, going into action. Did the action. cast work under uh, English Union? No, uh, always, always American, American, American Equity. Union. <coughs> so American. salaries were, were on the uh, American Union salaries right. for rehearsal in advance, right? That's right. And there's a provision in equity for rehearsing an American production in London, uh -huh. actually, and, and so we abided by those rules. But it was very costly. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, the, the, the English designers and the English director were, were a costly item if we had rehearsed here you know, because we would have been paying per diems to, to a, a director and, and designers and Miss Redgrave. So really, when it all came together, if you, had, if you had put it in either country, it would have fallen out pretty much the same financially. Mm -hmm. It was an expensive production to mount. What, what was the, the reason, since it was sort of six of one, half dozen the other, in terms of where you rehearsed, what was the reason for rehearsing in London? Was that because of Sir Peter Hall or Vanessa Redgrave? Or what was the reason then? It was mainly because Vanessa, when we in late February spoke to Vanessa about doing this play, she had made in, uh, she had made a personal commitment to Martin Sherman, the author of Bent, uh, to do a play at the Lyric Hammersmith uh, called uh, Afternoon in Goa. If I got that right, Madhouse, yeah. Madhouse in Goa. I, anyway, sh and she said, "Look, I have promised Martin Sherman that if the play succeeds at Lyric Hammersmith, I'm going to give him 12 weeks on the West End." Now. I don't know very many actresses who stick by that kind of commitment to playwrights. I mean, Miss Redgrave is quite interesting in, in her commitment to writers as an actress. I mean, it's very real for her. And I wasn't exactly thrilled about this, but there it was. And so the play opened at the Lyric Hammersmith, and it got kind of mixed notices. So I thought, oh, God, this problem's going to go away. She's not going to move it to the West End. But I did not bank on Miss Redgrave. She had promised Martin Sherman 12 weeks in the West End, and she was going to give him 12 weeks in the West End. And so at a, a tremendous cost in physical energy to her, except Miss Redgrave has more energy than, I think, a nuclear reactor. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, I mean she is, is an extraordinary woman of energy. I mean, she was playing in Martin Sherman's play and rehearsing during the day, and God knows doing what all else on her lunch hour. I mean, I can't ever keep track of her. But I mean, that was her commitment, and she honored it. So we had to, we said, if you move the play, we will rehearse in London. I must say, when I said it, I didn't think I was going to have to live up to it. But I got caught on that one, so. Well, do you think there were advantages in doing it that way? I think there were a lot, because as Barbara says, it's very hard to, to it was very interesting for Barbara and I to, 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 to track things. The cost of a rehearsal studio in London is fractions what a rehearsal studio I mean, we had a rehearsal studio in london for four weeks for what it would cost us here for one week uh the wigs were cheaper in london the the costumes were cheaper in london i mean so we made enormous savings in other areas which are very hard to 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 trigger in i think overall we probably gained by rehearsing in london when did sir peter hall come to new york when did he start working here with the cast well, the cast, the cast ended rehearsals in London. Right. We flew them the following day to New York. Then they had time off. And Sir Peter flew that very day that the cast flew, but he was in the theater immediately because his responsibilities, of course, included 
putting the lights in order and the sound in order. So How much time was needed for that here? It took the us theater. about four days to tech the show, five days to, mm -hmm. to tech it and dress it and put it before an invited audience. <laughs> but you smile. What is that? 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 What are you? What are you? Why are you smiling when well, you say before an invited audience? You really have to understand. I mean, it's as Josh said, it was a lonely road. I mean, we didn't we didn't know what to expect because we thought, well, maybe there would be pickets or maybe there would be a demonstration. Although interestingly enough, the police captain in charge was a Captain McCann, and no relation. <laughs> and he really thought I was quite mad. I mean. He's, a captain of police intelligence, he'd say, lady, nothing's going to happen. It's a play. And I just don't <laughs> understand. And so finally, you know, he got in touch with Lieutenant Nadell, who was the sort of liaison to the Jewish community in New York. And they kept saying, lady, there isn't going to be a problem. But we absolutely were convinced of the worst. And so we had the police sort of on alert in case on the first preview we had problems. We did. <laughs> we had a riot. We had the first air conditioning riot in the American theater. <laughs> Nobody cared about our politics. They cared about the fact that Peter Hall refused to turn on the air conditioning, which he thinks is a kind of archaic, barbaric, loud machine. And I mean, I thought, well, and Barbara said, what are you going to do? I mean, it's hot. I mean, because in addition to being hot, they were in the theater all day long rehearsing, so lights were burning in that theater without air conditioning for like 12 hours before the audience got in. And I said, there's only one way to, to win an argument on this subject, and that's not to turn on the air conditioning. Well, we didn't turn on the air conditioning, and we had the first air conditioning riots about in the American theater. At the we were all in the theater at that time. Well, some of us were hiding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of us, I was on the street, but unfortunately... It is an extraordinary thing that happened. No, I was on the street, and Peter said, if you want your money back, the management's on the street. And so the people started attacking me on the street, and this little lady came up to me, and she said, I couldn't hear a word in there. And I kept saying, well, madam, I'm real sorry. What is your name? I said, my name is McCann. Yes, Miss Pecan, I couldn't hear a word. <laughs> so from then on, I have been known around backstage as Miss Pecan, and, you know, and... There are two things that Vanessa is famous for. One is she's always saying to me, ah, oh, here is Miss Pecan. And one night when I went into her dressing room and I said I disagreed with her about something, she looked at me and she said, you're arguing with greatness. I said, all right, I won that one. So well, I, I think it was, it's a great tribute to the show and to Miss Redgrave that, that she went on and she behaved the way she did. And so few people did ask for their money back. No, well, that's not quite true. I mean, about, well, uh, but that's anyway. what I heard. Very few asked for it back, and she got a standing ovation at the end. Well deserved, too. So let's go on now. We've got the show on. After the show okay. opens now, you, in this case, as difficult as it was before, and as you were sort of nervous about everything, I guess, does it get easy then when you well, start I, to... We left at a really kind of interesting okay. a phenomenon about the show. In the cast is rehearsing in England, and Adrian Brian Brown and I, Adrian's my associate, uh, are in New York. So this is about the only show I've ever worked on where clearly I met the star of the show about two hours before the dress rehearsal. I mean, we went into her dressing room and said, hi, I'm Josh, hi, I'm Adrian. And she said, oh, what a pleasure to meet you at last. We'd been talking on the telephone and sending faxes back and forth. Uh, but it was kind of fascinating to like, behold the entire production all in one afternoon. I, it was meeting the actors, seeing the set, meeting the star, and seeing the run through, all of which happened over about a five hour period. Uh, normally that, that process you know, is, is weeks long and you get to know people well. On this one, I mean, it was odd because for example, if we wanted to talk to Vanessa Redgrave, she likes to talk early in the morning because I mean, she gets right out and has, as Liz said, great energy. So a good time to talk to her is about 10 o'clock in the morning, but that's five o'clock in the morning in New York. So we'd have to wake ourselves up like a half an hour before that because you can't talk to Vanessa Redgrave just after getting up. You still have to get yourself up and then talk to her. So we have this whole process of like kind of like working our day around how many hours different London was in New York and then sending faxes back and forth. And I should really say thank you to, really, to uh, Nikki Farai, who was the production press representative in London as the associate producer here because, she, I mean, the amount of legwork that it required to make it go smoothly was extraordinary, and the, it, there weren't any hitches. Let, let me ask you s sure. something, because there's, a, there's a, a, something a little different about this production, speaking of her and of Miss Redgrave, because she has said that she it, it will submit to interviews under very t sort of 
special circumstances, a certain thing she will not discuss, which is usually not the case. Has that proved to be, how, how, how has that worked from your standpoint? Um, Isn't that unusual, number one? It is unusual. Um, but it is consistent. Uh, which is to say that with the policy that's established, and I don't want to really talk too much about it because the part and parcel of, of our having this agreement is, is really that our, we really don't talk about it. But um, it is consistent and it applies to all publications, so it's not. But a has it been a problem for you as a press agent? No. <coughs> On the contrary, it hasn't. It's actually been kind of a, a kind of a, a, a fun phenomena. But I mean, it does mean probably that she has not had certain interviews that ordinarily might have ha might have occurred with someone of her. Right. But think about uh, the other the other uh, dynamic of it is the fact that <coughs> there is no access to her, and the only way that you can really experience Vanessa Redgrave is on that stage doing that play, and. I think that that's really fascinating. The fact is that it isn't such a, oh yeah, well I just saw her do Oprah Winfrey and I just thought, I mean, so that, she, that, that it's a totally familiar object. I mean, we have this extraordinary person and actress, and if you want to experience it, you can do it at the Neil Simon Theater, and I think that's pretty neat. I, I wasn't making a value judgment about whether it was right or wrong or good or bad. I was simply saying it was not the usual practice. It, and it, must have, it must have presented certain difficulties for you in terms of dealing with the press. On the contrary. I mean, yes. the fact is that it is a written document, so th there is no question about it. it. It exists. So did that eliminate the Today Show, the television, and the, and the standard things that a press agent wants its people on? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Let's go back to our dollars and cents, which I keep coming back to, is cost and, and each slice of the apple of the pie, where does it, uh, how does it end up? Let's, let's start talking about, I want, I'm not going to say I want to be a producer because I'm quite sane, but uh, <laughs> where, where do you start? You've got your money, you've got the show, you've got the star, and, and you've got your crew. Can we talk about percentages here? Um, the, the, the production cost of the show was a million, a million one. I think Barbara ended up bringing it in at a million fifty, and um, um, the weekly running costs are around one seventy-five plus a percentage rent to the theater. Um, everybody is working on what we call a profit pool formula, which is something that John uh, really developed. Um, more and more plays are being done that way. Most Broadway plays originally people got to pay a percentage of the gross. Uh, now they basically are paid on a percentage of the profit. And um, it's, I don't want to take up a lot of time explaining it. It's not that complicated, but it does take a little time to explain. But everybody on this show is on a percentage of profit, including Miss Redgrave, the estate of Tennessee Williams, Peter Hall, etc. And. Um, I, I believe we will get all our money out. I don't think we will, because of the high cost of doing the show, I don't think we'll make uh, oceans of money, but I think we will recoup the investment, which is an extraordinary accomplishment given that it's a dramatic show on Broadway with 27 people. And um, I guess that's about all I really, unless you have something to say about well, the finances. it's a limited run as well. I mean, it's extraordinary that we will, in fact, recoup the investment and, and then some we, ex we hope and expect. Um, given that we can only be there for a certain period of time because of the contracts. But you extended your run, haven't you? Yes. Mm -hmm. And did you, did, you think that, did you think that you would get your investment back at the limited runs terminal as you as Well, it hope springs eternal in the theater, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you, you never think anything. You, you, you do the best that you can to try and, and bring the show in intelligently at, at the least amount of money. That's the job. That's my job. My job is to, is to take the plan of the show, which is the budget, and realize it, and then some, so that it comes in under. And, and you either have more money to advertise with, which is absolutely critical, or you have more money to return to your investors, mm -hmm. another John, do you think element. this pool formula, which you were instrumental in developing, I as far as you're concerned, does it seem to be working well? Oh, it, do you want to explain that? Well, the, to, to try to simplify it to yeah. some degree, uh, the, the pool, so-called profit pool, simply is based on the theory that if a show makes money, 
meaning if every week you pay the bills mm -hmm. and there's something left for profit, weekly profit, everyone should share in that, meaning the writer, the playwright, in this case the estate, the actors, the, uh, uh, the producers, the director, everyone, and the investors get some money back. On the other hand, if the play has not made any money that week and it mm -hmm. loses money, no one should be making any real profits. In the old days, every, the, the royalty participants, the writer, the director, the stars, and all the creative team made money regardless of whether there was a profit every week because they got it right off the gross. So the theory was you can't continue to produce when dollars are being given, big dollars are being given to the writers and the actors and the producers, but the producer and the investors are getting nothing. So the profit pool was, was, was formulated about 12 years ago with a show called Nine and Woman of the Year was the result. Woman of the Year was a, a show that created this problem in spades, really. Uh, so that, in effect, we all either sink or swim. Everyone, the creative team <laughs> or the business people. It's the norm of business, though. That, that's, the, that's what governs business. And, and I know this is a very unbusiness-like business at theater, but... Well, that's right. That yeah is uh, the, the rule of thumb mm -hmm. in business that not until everybody's been paid off do you begin making a profit. We're going to have to stop this discussion, but we're going to go back to it and pick up on what it is to put a show on Broadway, and especially one that's come from London and, and one with the excitement of a marvelous star, but also the perils of, of this star. And, and we're talking about Orpheus descending, and, and uh, we're going to come back, and there's going to be questions that are going to be asked, and we're going to hope that um, we're going to answer as much of them as possible from this wonderful team of, of professionals that are on stage here at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. So don't go far away. This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. We're back at the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theater, and these seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Today's seminar is on the production, and the entire producing team of Orpheus Descending is with us today to discuss what it is to put a show on on Broadway. We were in the midst, when we stopped and interrupted this, we were in the midst of talking about who pays for what and where the money goes. and when you get it back and how you get it back. And I'm going to start with Liz McCann to uh, go into that along with um, Ed Wilson, who was our co-moderator, and Gene Dalrymple. And perhaps you'll address that question now. Well, the, uh, Jean said in our first hour that Liz McCann was one of, she said six, I would cut it down to four or three maybe, producers who were on the one hand as enthusiastic and as knowledgeable as Liz is. And one of the things that uh, has to do with the way you control costs in this production. John Braleo was telling me during the break that one of the things that you did that was so essential and so effective in this was to fight for costs in terms of every single item as far as airfares were concerned to get the British people over here and per diems and other costs. Uh, is that a constant battle? Uh, yes, it's a constant battle for any producer who's keeping costs down. I think I think um, um, with Barbara, that is something that, that, you know, I'm a very hands-on kind of producer because that's the way I've always worked. And, um, and I think, I don't know what else to say on the subject. It's just a constant battle, whatever the play is, particularly if you produce serious plays. I mean, there's no room on dramatic play, uh, musical plays either. I mean, cost, Watching the pennies is urgent because there's always a surprise. It's as simple as that. In the end, you have to pay for the surprises. If Peter Hall walks in the theater and says, I really hate that curtain. It's going to ruin the play. 
well, you're going to have to find the money to buy the new curtain. So you, 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 you've got to be able to swing because we're, we're dealing with artists. They change their mind. They, they make mistakes. And, and whatever it is, it's, and, and you have to be ready to, to give them the money they need. First and foremost, my responsibility is, is to make sure the artist has what the artist needs. And so there's always some place at which, you know, there's a surprise. So fighting for airfares just means that when Peter decides he must have that curtain or he must have this thing, which he didn't think he was going to need, we're going to be able to give it to him. But as a, a knowledgeable producer and one of the few, we go back to that again, that uh, you know what is necessary in, in your costs. You know that the set that has uh, a turntable is that much more expensive than the one without. And you know then that you can sit down and say, let's not use that, let's use this instead. So you have to make the decision then on the curtain, the turntable, or whatever, because you also have a responsibility to your investors as well. Uh, where, where, where do you, how do you work that out? Well, Peter, it's mainly a, a job of constantly working with the creative people. Peter Hall is, is, is quite responsible uh, as, as a director. And if you, and after all, Peter Hall is himself a producer. I mean, he, he was really the uh, head of the National Theatre of Great Britain, so he was a producer, I mean, as well as a, a director. So that he's very responsive. If I say, listen, this is going to cost X, and can we do it another way? Um, he's very responsive. He's not uh, a, a wasteful man. But in any event, there is a moment when he wants something that he just feels he needs, and you've got to give it to him. It's as simple as that. Liz, don't you find <coughs> this is very rare in the theatre today? that a producer has the whole thing in his hands the way we used to. Well, Jean, I think when you, 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 I mean, having known you when you were a producer, I mean, that was the tradition of the theater. A producer knew everything that was going on. Uh, that has become less and less a tradition in the exactly. theater. And in a funny way, it, it, I think, has a direct bearing on what happens aesthetically and artistically. Yes. Um, I think, you know, I mean, uh, whether it was Kermit Bloomgarden or David Merrick, I mean, by God, they knew where every dime was on that stage. And there is a great tendency now to have first-time producers who really don't know what else to do but go to ad meetings. And I mean, <laughs> producing takes a lot of work if you stay on top of the production, which is your job. <coughs> Well, the producer used to be the mother and the father of the production. Nothing could happen that they didn't know about and didn't have an interest in and didn't make the decision about. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? That isn't true now. It seems to be done by committee or something. Well, it's real hard because, first of all, money is very... I mean, I was very lucky in this production. I mean, in Jimmy Needlander, I had a partner who completely trusted me and who was available to me when I needed advice. And it would be a mistake not to say that Jimmy, on several key occasions, did not give me a piece of advice that was very valuable. Um, I obviously am, am half in love with Jimmy Needlander. But, um, <laughs> and, and he trusts me, but he's there for me. It's a wonderful combination. But I don't have to sit around a room with five partners. I mean, when I was a kid, somebody, when I was a kid, when I was in school, um, a nun said to me once, the only good thing ever accomplished by a committee was the King James Version of the Bible. And I have never forgotten that. And whenever I see six producers build, I think, God almighty. Yeah. It, t it drains energy. I don't know what to do, you know, in the business today because it's so hard to raise money. But if I have to worry about Peter Hall and Vanessa and this one and that one, I don't have time to sit down with five other How many other producers partners. are there in your show? Two. It's just wonderful. Just Jimmy and me. And that's it. Who, and uh, who is responsible for bringing in your money? Well, I, I was afraid to get around to that question <laughs> because, I mean, actually, the money raising on this production was quite amusing. But, I mean, nobody wants to invest in the theater. I mean, that's, that's a given. I mean, it's not a very attractive place for investment these days. And particularly if it's a straight play and it's a revival and it's a large cast, it has everything else going for it. And then if you want to have an added excuse, you can add Miss Redgrave as an excuse. No one's going to come. 
So Jimmy had done a canvas of, of several of his investors, and they weren't terribly interested in investing. And I had done a canvas of some of my investors, and some of them were interested, but some of them weren't very interested. And there was a memorable meeting in, in Jimmy's office where we stared at each other across the table, and we admitted to each other that we didn't have any investors. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a kind of it was an interesting moment. And I, I said to Jimmy, okay, I've got just enough leverage out there to blow every contract without it being embarrassed. I mean, I can really dig my heels in and blow the author's contract, blow the director's contract, blow Miss Redgrave's contract, and no one's going to think anything of this. I mean, we can get out of this right here and now. And we sat and we sort of stared at each other, and, and Jimmy just kind of looked at me and he said, we're going to do it. <laughs> and I rolled my eyes forward. I said, okay. Well, he said, well, what's the budget? A million one? I said, yeah. He said, well, what do you think we can float it for? I said, <laughs> maybe <laughs> half a million. Now, <laughs> That's quite a float. I mean, when Barbara heard that, she got like squeamish beyond belief. You know, it's like half a million dollar float. What do you do with the other six hundred thousand dollars of money you don't quite have in the bank? The the, the cash money came from Jimmy. Uh, he was very supportive in that respect, and it it came. And we were very creative about cash flow. I mean, we this was, a, this was definitely a junk bond deal or a leverage buyout. I don't know what you want to say, but it was all of those things. Fortunately, I had done one of the smartest things I've ever done in my life, and I commend it to you as a producer. I produced a major flop called uh, Leader of the Pack, and it went wildly over budget. It can happen with an experienced producer, and we were about $300,000, $350,000 over budget, and I said, I'm paying everyone. That's it. I'm paying off all my creditors, and I did. So the result is if I pick up the phone now and I say, send scenery, you'll get paid, scenery gets shipped. And um, so between my credit references and Jimmy's half a million, we managed to get this thing floating, and my credit cards, and I mean, we really managed to get it going. I mean, Barbara walked in the office one day and she said, how do we get the cast to London? I also must tell you one thing else that happened in the middle of this is that, that Jimmy got quite ill. And, um, and 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 um, he had a, a very mild stroke from which he's fully recovered right now. But at the moment, he was sort of uncommunicado for about three weeks. So I mean, that was another drama that was going on someplace on this production. And in the middle of this drama, Barbara walked in and she said, "How do we get the cast to London?" And fortunately, I have an unlimited gold American Express card. So the cast went to London on my American Express card. This is really corporate sponsorship that American American Express did not know it was doing this year. But but we we you know we got it. But the other thing where Jimmy was smart is Jimmy said to me, "Run an ad early." And I said, I was a little edgy about this because we didn't have money to pay for the ad, but Jimmy said, get the ad in the paper early. And we ran an ad very early, and we knew she was selling tickets. And that was entirely Jimmy's call. And we ran the ad very early, and we got an overwhelming response. And so we knew that we were probably going to be okay, which made us a little you bit more bold. This. This. Did you get any corporate sponsorship, any corporate money no, from this at all? No, we got none. And I, I think, and John and I have spoken about this, and I don't know quite what we're going to do about it. I mean, the biggest single problem we have on Broadway is investment money. Mm -hmm. It is, t it's very exactly. difficult to raise money, and what you have to give right. up either by way of control, which you have to give up by way of points or money or anything like that, is one thing, which you have to give up by way of control is very frightening to a producer. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't know how we're going to solve that problem, but that is the major reason. When people talk about where is the American musical, why are all these musicals being done in England? They're being done in England because they cost less, not because England is loaded down with musical talent. I mean, far from it. But I mean, uh, they can well, get the production on. That, but is there any way that you can get some of the costs down here? Can you roll back your unions and no. your house and your cost? It's real hard. It, there's. First of all, the industry did it. They, they, you know, said we're to unions. You just have to go back on it on your cost. Is there any way that you can do it with a theater crafts? But here you see there are some very, very singularly successful shows, and the 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 existence of Phantom of the Opera and Les Misérables. Those shows alone force you into a situation with the unions where you can't you cannot plead poverty or distress in order to get everyone to the table, because they are extraordinarily successful. What's the largest successful. cost in, 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 in your show? Is it, it, would, would you like to take mm -hmm. a stab at that? We're, we're I would get, what is Go the Go ahead. 
Oh, oh wait. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, you're the general manager. You go ahead. I um, think the largest. Well, I mean, salaries are, are the largest. Mm -hmm. Equity salaries. All okay. salaries. All salaries. All salaries. All Stagehands, musicians, equ ev everyone's salary. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, that's where the unions are, are present. Well, we're going to open this to questions now and, and uh, d take a deep breath because you're not finished yet. <laughs> so now, our first question. Would you like to come up and ask your question? Greetings, all. I'm uh, Bob with 3B's Goldstein. Uh, two years ago, I co-produced the Tammy Grimes musical Mademoiselle Cologne. Uh, this is addressed to Ms. McCann. We've talked on the phone a few times. Liz, uh, what makes you decide to produce a revival of a work rather than a new work? And forgive the loaded question. It, it's, it's, I sometimes don't know what makes me produce anything. Sometimes afterwards I look back and I can formulate the reason. If I have to formulate the reason on this show, I would say I produced this play because Jimmy Needlander believed it and it asked me to do it. He had an, for a man who didn't see the play, I don't know where his faith came from, but it was unerring. And, and that I must say, but I, I don't know why I do plays. Did I do this play because there's a speech in it about loneliness? I don't know why I do anything. I mean, I, I, I believe producers do things instinctively. As knowledgeable as I am, and as much as I know about the theater, and as much as I can give you the, the, the scratch sheet on what I think Frank Rich is going to write about any play this year, and I, you know, I, I, like any professional, I do that. On some basic level, I look at a property and some gut instinct comes into play, which I cannot describe. I don't know any other way to say it. Do you know what I mean, John? I mean, I, I have to love it. I loved a play called Total Abandon. It lasted one night. I mean, what, what else can I tell you? It made no sense to produce it. It lasted one night. I loved it. It said something to me. So that you say it, it, it's not whether it's a revival or, or no, it a has new nothing play or to a do with play. that. It's because what the play says to you. On some level that I sometimes can't even articulate. Right. Okay. okay. Hello, I'm Joan Ungarrow. I'm a director, and I have a question for Barbara Darwell as general manager. Just asking if you could be a bit more specific about the contribution of the American designer team, especially the sound designer and the light designer, to the very English production of the American play that we are talking about. Well, thankfully, we had on both sides of the Atlantic really extraordinary design help. I mean, the, the original production was, desi was designed in London, the sound designed specifically by a, by a brilliant man by the name of Paul Arditi, and he, of course, worked in collaboration with his creative team. Um, uh, when we move, when you move a, a, a British production to the United States, you are obliged by union regulation to hire American people. And so we sort of take that, the best of that, and, and we form new collaborations. And in this case, Neil Peter Jampolis uh, was the American who, who um, facilitated on this side of the Atlantic both the lights and the set. And he knew the, the designers in London. So we did a lot of cross-Atlantic you know, faxing and traveling, and and uh, it was it was the individuals themselves who made the process so so successful. Does that answer? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Linda Herr. I'm chairman of the Department of Theater at Connecticut College, and I guess this is for Mr. Reglio or Ms. McCann, and it is how difficult was it, or what is the process involved in negotiating the extension of the run? Ah. Uh caught in a trap. The extent, the negotiation was before the run. I mean, before. we always, to some extent, announcing 12 weeks was a marketing ploy. Sorry about that, guys, but that's what it was. I mean, let's not, let's not fool it. Every actor was under contract till April the 7th from the moment of opening night. We tried to, to cap, we tried to, um, in some strange ways, this is a very old-fashioned promotion. Uh, there was a mail order ad. People have given up with mail order ads. I mean, they, nobody sends in mail, everybody said. Well, we did a mail order ad. And in the old days in the theater, before computers, you could only rack 8 to 12 weeks of tickets in your ticket racks at one time. So you only had 12 weeks of tickets on sale because you didn't have another printing of tickets. With computers, you could sell tickets into the, you know, the next century. <laughs> but basically all we're doing is the old-fashioned ploy of having tickets on sale 12 weeks in advance at any time. We're still on sale 12 weeks in advance. We just keep pushing back the 12 weeks. 
That's all. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Joe Coenkis, and my question is for Ms. McCann. I'd like to know what uh, Ms. Redgrave's role was in the casting of the production. Ms. Redgrave's role in casting of the production is she met Kevin Anderson, and she approved him to play Val. She has a contractual right of approval for Val. Um, outside of that, because she was in London, uh, she chose to, to let Peter Hall totally cast the play, which he did here in the United States with his regular casting directors, Johnson Liff. We sent her photographs of all the actors so that she would be familiar with their background before she met them in rehearsal, and that was it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adam Kovacs. I have a question for Ms. McCann or panel in general. Uh, how do you choose a theater? Do the owners bid for a play, or how important is the choice in any case? The choice of a theater is, in my judgment, the most important judgment uh, uh, you, you, you make on a play. Um, I have a cliche phrase that's saying it's a little like having a diamond, but if you don't put it in the right setting, you're in trouble. Uh, Frequently, with more and more money coming from theater owners, your choices are limited to the, to the, to the place that, that those producers, those theater owners control. Uh, we, um, Jimmy obviously owed the, owned the Neil Simon. We also took a look at the 46th Street, which is the theater he owned. Uh, we consider the Atkinson, which is a smaller theater he owned. Some of the choices were dictated by economics, how many seats in the theater, uh, the size of the production, the size of the stage. These are things you can't really control. What about financial considerations? Does that come into it? Well, the two considerations are the capacity of the theater and whether or not roughly you can break even. I like to be able to cover my costs at roughly 50% of the capacity of the house. Uh, and so the, the capacity of the house is a consideration. The backstage facilities, the, the depth of the stage, I think actually we found out that this set would not fit the 46th Street, which is, I think, why we ended up at the Simon. Um, and... Um, Past that, just the general ambiance or atmosphere for theater, it's very hard to describe. The first play I produced was a play called Dracula, and we had our choice of the Martin Beck or the St. James. Uh, and we wanted the Martin Beck, and everybody thought we were nuts because it was on the other side of 8th Avenue and it hadn't been painted for years, but I had re remembered sitting in that theater with another director called Frank Dunlop on another play that was a flop, and he used to sit there and say, I can't play comedy in the Martin Beck. This is a haunted house. And when we came to do Dracula, I remember that, and I kept saying, I want the Martin Beck. <laughs> and the, my theater owner partner in that production owned the St. James. He kept saying, why don't you want the St. James? It's next to Sardis, which I'm bearing on anything. But really, <laughs> the success of Dracula, and I reg I'm saying this publicly, and I hope the Jujamson Theater, who people who now own the Martin Beck are listening to me, you painted that theater rose, you made a major mistake, you should never have painted that theater. But anyway, before it was painted, it was legitimately haunted, and it was fair, it's one of the few theaters in New York at that point I never liked to go into alone. That sounds very odd, but I used to get very nervous sitting in that house alone. So, I mean, that, but uh, the Lyceum, the choice of the Lyceum was we wanted that theater. We wanted it for mornings at 7. It was the oldest theater in New York, and we want, there was something about that theater that said that was the right choice of theater. Thank you. What were some of the physical production differences between New York and London? Did you transport the set, or did you salvage any of it? Or? We tr yes, we transported the entire set. We laid down a new deck. Um, because the, the, the opening of the portal was, was a different size, we really redesigned the lighting to, to a substantial degree. We, we enhanced the lighting here. Other than that, the, we, we had the same costume designer, uh, and she pulled new costumes for a new group of people because the cast was primarily American. But as, you know, we, we, we used the, the British design concepts all the way through though they may have been facilitated here by United States designers. I'm just curious, how is it shipped um, by boat or by air? By boat. Okay. Thank you. When you said about lighting, did, uh, were there, are there many more instruments here in the Neil Simon than there were in the theater in London? Yes. Not many more, but more. Yeah. Is there any, do you have any feeling at all about uh, a national theater being able to call a pun a group of, of performers such as Sir Peter Hall can do coming from his background. Is there anything like that 
uh, foreseeable in the States. We have it in like Playwrights Horizon, Manhattan Theatre Club, Paps, and, and Steppenwolf. There are coming up around groups of resident theaters, but is there, is there any way that we could possibly have this interchange of talents that they have over there? Would you like to see it, Liz? Would it be? Well, the, the, the English are very lucky, but even that system is beginning to fall apart. I mean, I am fond of saying that nobody with the Royal Shakespeare Company had the resources to do Nicholas Nickleby. And when I say that, I am not demeaning American talent. But when you have 150 actors under annual contract, and you have under contract composers, and scenic artists, and designers, and rehearsal facilities in Stratford, so you can do it in Stratford and then move it into London. I mean, you have the resources to support the artists. We do not have theater institutions in this city that support, or in this country for that matter, that support artists that fully. And that's part of the problem. The reason I say it's breaking down here is when I was in England, this summer, the Royal Shakespeare Company is, is the last theater, I think they told me, in England that still has actors under annual contract. And they are finding it very difficult to get actors to sign annual contracts. So even they are breaking away from that system. What do you mean by supporting the artists, having systems of supporting the artists? What, well, what, it's what just, I don't know quite what you mean. I don't mean financial support. I mean the resources. I mean, you know, as I'm, you know, as I say, the, the Royal Shakespeare Company has an entire music department. It's something I feel very strongly about, by the way, is the use of music in straight plays. And, and every straight play I produced that was a success had music in it. Elephant Man had a musical score. Dracula had a musical score. Amadeus, obviously, and now this. And we have gotten away from using music in straight plays. And I think it's a mistake, because I think it, it, well, I think it's a mistake for me. Other people don't. But I mean, I think it, it rounds out the experience, but I mean, at the, Nash at the Royal Shakespeare Company, there's a, there's a whole music department, a whole bunch of composers, a whole fight department. And these people work together again and again and again and again. Um, and that's very significant. As a Broadway producer, would you support off-Broadway uh, in order to get this kind of support for performers? Oh, sure. For, for everybody in the theater, yeah. in a sense. Because that seems to be a, a nurturing ground for uh, young people. Yeah, I think uh, it's significant that you have, when you have a playwright like August Wilson, who John happens to represent, um, and we've had, I think, four plays from August in a very short period of time, is that August has, has a community of the same director, Lloyd Richards, and he knows that his plays will get on at Yale. What has happened so frequently here, and that happens with Playwrights Horizons. Wendy Wasserstein knows that Andre Bishop will, will put on a play of hers. And that nurturing process is very, very important. It used to happen in the commercial theater years ago. Kermit Bloomgarden always produced the plays of Lillian Hellman. I believe I'm right in that, am I not, Jean? Always produced Lillian Hellman's plays. And so there was a continuity of I'll I think support. that's what's, what's needed, and I hope that more Broadway producers will be able to help us in doing that, because I think that's where it comes from. I find myself once more having to interrupt this. I, I have a half a dozen questions so that uh, Liz has not answered in this wonderful producing team of Office Descending that have taken the time to come here and give us some of the background uh, of what it is to produce in the theater, what it is to work in the theater. These seminars are but one of the programs of the all year round American Theater Wing. And, and I also want to mention that part of our, one of our programs is a, a theater ticket program in, in which producers like Liz and many others make available to us uh, tickets for the theater so that young people and young students and young volunteers are able to see quality theater and we're indeed grateful to them. I'm Isabel Stevenson, I'm president of the American Theater Wing and I thank you all for coming here and I thank this marvelous panel for being here. Thank you.